morning. I live in an off-grid, solar-powered, wood-heated straw bale cabin in the mountains. And I have a garden large enough to feed my entire family for a year. Or, at least it would be if I actually knew how to garden. <laughs> I was not always a backwoods hipster with a splitting mall. I actually used to wear designer suits to management meetings and have loud and very important phone conversations in airport lounges, <laughs> as many of you someday probably will. It all started over a decade ago. I was living in metropolitan Europe, and I ambitiously decided that I would make pesto from scratch. So I went to the grocery store to get ingredients, and I was looking for little boxes of basil leaves only to discover they didn't have them. All they had were little plants of basil in a pot. So I bought one, and I took it home, and I tore it to bits, and I made my pesto, and I left this pot on the counter with a little stalk and a couple of leaves dangling from it, presumably to die. And much to my surprise, and despite blatant neglect, <laughs> except for perhaps the occasional sip of coffee that I shared, it grew back. And one day, I was standing there in my kitchen looking at this full basil plant, and I had a small but profound realization. I was in control of my basil supply chain. <laughs> now, for any of you who are cooks, you will recognize that that is the same thing as culinary omnipotence. <laughs> and so I started to wonder, what else can I do? So I grew thyme and rosemary and sage, and I had an entire herb garden in my kitchen. And then I took it to the next level. I later moved to Ireland, where only cynicism and root vegetables are known to thrive. <laughs> and despite the ceaseless rains and the battering winds of the sea, I managed to grow a small crop of parsnip in my yard. I had no idea how to cook it. Later, I moved to Frankfurt, and I had limited space because I had an apartment, so all I had was a balcony. And I thought, I'm going to try this vertical gardening thing. I've got all the skills now. <laughs> <laughs> so I grew tomato bushes that would wind up my railing, and my neighbors would reach over and pluck tomatoes for their summer salads, and they would leave me bottles of wine in gratitude. <laughs> this is what we call a symbiotic relationship. <laughs> Later, I moved to India, where the climate is incredible for growing. But I was so afraid of diphtheria cultivating in the soil that instead of gardening, I focused my energy on teaching the staff that MSG and salt are not the same thing. <laughs> and I managed in that time to learn just enough to get myself into trouble. So when I moved back to the Rockies sometime later, I had enough knowledge and optimism, and understanding of the benefits of it, that I decided I would live off the land. <laughs> and so I optimistically acquired 10 acres of a granite hilltop with a straw bale house. Now, the owner, the previous owner, was gracious enough to leave me a book titled The Straw Bale House, which came in handy a month later when I tried to burn it down and flood it on the very same day. <laughs> I have a lot of these kinds of stories. And while I am learning many, many things about solar energy and about how to chop firewood without blowing out my shoulders and about the evils of aphids, what I am finding most profound is this. Developing a personal connection to the systems that support our lives and our vitality from food to water to housing to electricity, improves our quality of life and the health of the planet. Now, this is true at any scale, and so it applies to everybody here today. Because whether you are student or retired, whether you are a child or parent, whether you live in a dorm room or you have your own yard, you can have an impact. So, 
We're seeing this happen already, that research is telling us these changes are beneficial to our health. From everything that we can learn in building, to landscaping, to gardening, and everything, of course, that Karate Kid ever learned from Mr. Miyagi. <laughs> the studies show us that these activities improve our physical, emotional, and our mental health. It's no surprise, then, that studies across the globe are showing us in different centers where people are addressing addiction and other disorders with means such as biodynamic farming to develop connection and a sense of worth and purpose and community in these individuals. Furthermore, different rehabilitation centers that focus on depression and mental and emotional disorders are finding that means such as animal husbandry and gardening are reducing the use of pharmaceutical intervention. These guys are also reporting a marked decrease in relapse. And countless other studies show us that learning things throughout the course of our lives reduces brain atrophy and increases our sense of well-being and our happiness. And it also increases self-reliance. Now, this does not mean that we're trying to reject technology. In fact, technology is what makes it possible. The developments of technology facilitate these changes in a more easy way. I just spent the last weeks watching YouTube videos on how to adjust my solar panels for the winter months. Now I have to watch a few more on parkour and rock climbing <laughs> so I can actually get onto my roof and do it. <laughs> and what we're seeing now is that these developments in technology that are happening at a faster rate, for example, the reduction in price of solar panels, are actually evidence of this growing trend, this shift towards self-reliance and the resulting and unavoidable conservationism. Because let me tell you something, if your hairdryer draws 30 amps, you are probably not going to use it very often. In fact, you're gonna dry your curls in front of the wood stove. Don't get too close, it's a mistake <laughs> you only make once. <laughs> and if you are irrigating your gray water from your house into your garden, you are not gonna buy Pert Plus shampoo. No, you're gonna buy some kind of organic hippie sauce that's <laughs> PETA and planet friendly. And you don't have to worry about having flat hair because your pumpkins are gonna win prizes at the fair this year. <laughs> and if you have to transport your trash every week in the back of your Subaru to the dump, which is a quite nasty job, I might add, you are going to become acutely aware of how much of it you're creating and how effectively you're recycling. Awareness is the first step towards connection. And, and talking about self-reliance does not suggest isolation, but rather empowerment. Empowerment for us to adapt to our environment and to adapt our environment to us in ways that are meaningful. It doesn't suggest that we inherently know how to do these things by any means, but rather that we are capable of learning. And I have an example of this if not many. I love a vegetable called kohlrabi. It belongs in the cabbage family, and of course is therefore heartily consumed by the Germans. And now in Germany, you pay about a half euro for a pound of it. Now because kohlrabi is difficult for us to spell or pronounce here in America, we consider it an exotic vegetable. And you pay maybe 10 times that much for it at Whole Foods. So I thought, I'm gonna grow my own, or at least I'll try. You know my gardening skills are lacking. And so I, I planted a bunch of it in my yard this year, and then I learned, as I'm learning about connections, that dogs are omnivores. <laughs> and that they will in fact eat an entire crop of cruciferous vegetables in a single afternoon if you leave the garden gate open and have just fertilized with fish bits. 
so what I am learning about developing these connections is that it can be done at any scale. Regardless of the lifestyle that you are choosing to live, whether you're a city dweller or a country dweller, the changes you make, significant or seemingly insignificant, will have an impact. So looking around today at our room full of people, we don't see a bunch of barefoot hippies who want to join a commune and sing Kumbaya. Rather, what I see are generations of engaged adults and people who want to know how to live a full and rewarding life, keep their iPhone charged, and not be responsible for the obliteration of the planet. So the question I have for you today, the question I want you to ask yourselves when you get home is not, what's a kohlrabi and how do I cook it? Just Google that. But how can I develop a connection to my environment? Now, for most of us, we start with the food chain because we all eat. And honestly, because if you want to try to harvest rainwater to flush your toilet, it might be a little bit of a hard sell for the roommates. <laughs> so maybe your first step is making your first meal from scratch instead of pulling it out of a package. That's a connection. And maybe your next step is that you want to buy local. So you go to the farmer's market where you will inevitably meet some mad science permaculture guy who explains to you the meaning of full moon planting while you buy some probably very great squash. This too is a connection and maybe a little bit of witchcraft. Maybe you want to develop a connection and be part of your gift supply chain. And so you teach yourself how to knit until everybody you know has a scratchy scarf and a beanie. <laughs> and maybe it's that you're tired of buying batteries just to throw them away again. And so you put a generator on your bike to light your way at night. This is also a connection. And maybe that connection evolves into you putting solar panels on your home one day so that you can control your power supply. This is a connection. And trust me, you will ban hair dryers and air conditioners. <laughs> now, with these connections, every time we make one, we develop a deeper understanding of the systems upon which we rely and how they relate to our environment. So we understand what it takes to plant a seed so that it germinates. We understand how much energy and nourishment goes into it so that it becomes a tree. We understand that the systems of nature, such as bees pollinating, make it possible for that tree to produce fruit. And we also begin to understand how much energy it takes to get that nectarine from Chile all the way to our produce aisle here at home. And in as much we start to observe other things around us in the systems, things that are maybe man-made. We'll drive past a dam and pause in awe at how much power they create because we're consuming it. And then we ask questions, and we question things like the efficiency of our supply chain. We start questioning the wastefulness of consumerism, and then even our own individual impact on this very planet. And then it graduates even further and develops to us cultivating an understanding of the system and our relationship to them, a value for those systems. And then furthermore, an understanding and a value for our place within it because we too have place and purpose and value in these systems. We are not just consumers. We are also creators, and the choice is ours. Which one will you be today? Thank you. <laughs>